located in prime Great Lakes territory, two protected areas sit side by side, brimming with life, spectacular scenery, and cultural treasures. This is also the largest natural landscape left in southern Ontario. The northern Bruce Peninsula is renowned for its rich biological diversity. Bruce Peninsula National Park and Fathom 5 National Marine Park are the last refuge in southern Ontario for many rare species. Thousand-year-old cedars, rare orchids, and the eastern Massasauga rattlesnake all live with and within the landscape's rocky cracks and crevices. While the jagged landscape is the reason so many ships wrecked here, that bedrock is also why the visibility is so great. But life underwater is out of control. Invasive species are taking over. For life out of the water, humans are the bigger threat. In 1987, Bruce Peninsula National Park and Fathom 5 National Marine Park were established to protect the natural and cultural resources in the area. We have over 870 species of vascular plants, 37 mammal species, 26 species of reptiles and amphibians, and well over 3,000 species of insects. Straddling Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, these two parks are a natural sanctuary in a swarm of development that is southern Ontario. These parks are located within a five hours drive of nine million Canadians, or 25% of the country's population. Beneath them is the Niagara Escarpment, an ancient geological backbone running through the national parks and into the Great Lakes region. You can see it in the cliffs, caves, and under this lush landscape. Scenery really is a result of two time periods of geological history. Um, first about 400 million years ago when the rocks that we see around us were deposited. And then uh, more recently in the last million years, particularly the last probably 15 to 20,000 years, when uh, glaciation uh, occurred in this area, in much of North America, shaping these rocks to the shapes that we see today. Many species call the area's diverse habitats home. Some of the natural features that sort of characterize this area is the fact that we are home to a small population of black bears. We're also home to the eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. This is Ontario's only venomous snake The eastern Massasauga rattlesnake likes its space. These areas were smoothed out by retreating glaciers, creating an alvar habitat. It provides flat, rocky areas where the snakes can quickly warm up in the sun, as well as stumps, logs, and rock crevices where the snakes can hide. Their populations might be healthy within the parks, but they are a threatened species, and their numbers are declining. They're being squeezed out of their habitats, and they also face persecution. When someone finds a snake in their backyard, if they're a parent, they may say, well, I don't want that venomous snake here, and they whack with a shovel. And that's been one of the reasons we believe it's disappeared from a lot of its range. What makes it even more challenging is that in Bruce Peninsula National Park, Chunks of public parkland, shown here in green, are separated by big chunks of private land. 
Parks Canada is attempting to remedy the situation by asking people to leave the snakes alone. So we're encouraging people how to cohabitate with them and the fact you don't have to chop its head off with a shovel and the fact that that's illegal. Even so, roadkill is still a big concern for the rattlesnakes and bears. They take a two-pronged approach when studying the bears. They monitor them all year round, including in the winter when the bears are hibernating. So we visit them usually around uh, late February, and that's when the, they're getting a bit more active, and we move into the den, we put mom to sleep. But first, they have to find them. We tracked the den from the signal on the radio collar. And uh, normally on the Bruce Peninsula here, it's, it's in uh, crevices in the karst geomorphology, which is down in the rocks. There are natural openings and fissures. There's very little soil here, quite different than a lot of uh, bear dens, which are excavated in soil. So what we're going to do is open up the opening. And with the mobilizing drugs, we're going to uh, put her to sleep for, for probably about an hour. And then we can handle her, we can bring her out and um, check her collar, uh, do her measurements, her weight, to see how the health of, of how she's doing. But most importantly, we're finding if she's having babies. Go. Got one. Thank you. You have one. They Thank find you. three new baby bears in this den. Okay, uh, okay, number three is a uh, female. Just double check that. Th ear length is 30. 2.2 kilos. There are very few black bears left outside the peninsula in the rest of southern Ontario. About 200 live on the peninsula, and about 50 within park boundaries. That's a very small population, and biologists look at the thing called viability of populations. You know, is 50 bears enough to sustain itself long term, or are they slowly going to become extinct because the population is too small? One, two, three. One, two, three. That's good, Brent. Let's just leave her and cover up. She'll come through and just crawl back in there. Yeah. I think it was all a bad dream. Once they emerge in the spring, the scientists will track the bears by setting up traps to collect hair samples for DNA testing. Okay, this one's hit. They trick the bears into brushing up against barbed wire by hanging a can of sardines above it. Yeah, okay, here's one right here. Got a nice, nice clump of bear hair. Perfect. I'll just see the, the teeth marks in that, that the bears pulled it apart. So we know it's not a raccoon or a fisher, it's definitely a bear that, from the damage on the cans. This is just one of 32 traps set around the Bruce Peninsula National Park. With it, they can identify the individual bears that hit these traps to estimate the size of the population and how they move across this fragmented landscape. And there it is, set for another week. On one hand, they need to protect the wildlife within the park. But given the park's checkerboard boundaries, that's often a difficult task. We can't separate people from, from the parks. We can't separate people from the landscape. So. That is probably the biggest challenge because there is this fragmented ecosystem by roads and there is this fragmented human management too that uh, a lot of jurisdictions don't always pull together. 
It's not just a threat to the wildlife, but also for the rare and beautiful plants that once flourished here. Here in the Bruce Peninsula National Park and the adjacent Fathom 5 National Marine Park in southern Ontario, rocks are the foundation to this area's story. Life and geology are deeply embedded on the escarpment. The story actually goes back 450 million years ago when, when this was at the edge of a, almost an equatorial, uh, warm, shallow sea. The rocks here today are the skeletal remains of that ancient marine life. This area has undergone many metamorphoses since then. Water evaporated. Glaciers formed, but only to retreat again thousands of years ago, taking the top layer of rock with them. The underlying bedrock of the Bruce Peninsula is comprised mostly of dolostone, which is a member of the limestone family. It's very alkaline. And on top of that, we get uh, this duff layer, this really spongy duff layer of mostly cedar boughs. Life flourishes here. Orchids, which are abundant in the area, are showiest in late spring. May and June is really the best time of the year to see orchids on the Bruce Peninsula. There's 46 species that grow in Bruce and Gray counties, and almost 40 species grow in the park, which is remarkable. Huge diversity. 50 years ago, it was a different story. Orchids are often victims of their own beauty. There would be big, showy specimens. There would be more orchids. There would be uh, just more to see. And we've lost that natural heritage over time from individuals coming in and collecting from areas such as this. So I think that's a real shame. The western Huron side of Bruce Peninsula Park is flat compared to the rugged eastern Georgian Bay side. After the glacier left the Niagara Escarpment, the land rebounded when all that glacial weight lifted. Water levels fluctuated. These stacks, cliffs, and caves were carved out by the erosive power of water when lake levels were much higher. The park's famous flower pots are a prime example. If you look closely at a flower pot, you'll see that the upper part, um, the, the bedding planes, the thickness of the units are much more so than underneath, than the lower part. Uh, the lower part of the flower pots tend to be much thinner bed, so uh, of course can be eroded more quickly by waves. We also have sea caves, which are the same sort of idea, but instead of being long and shallower, they tend to be deeper and narrower. At one point, after the water levels were really high, they dropped again, much lower than they are today. They know that because they found 9,000-year-old trees rooted to the bottom of Georgian Bay. These are the same species of cedars found perched on cliff faces throughout the Niagara Escarpment. It was only when we started doing the work in the late 80s that we, we thought, oh my god, we've discovered a whole new ecosystem that's basically been ignored for a long period of time. Some even grow for more than a thousand years. The ancient cedars are an incredibly important part of our natural history because if you go back a thousand years, um, there's nothing alive now that would have been alive then except some of these ancient cedars. So what I, we have here is a, a cross-section from a, a, a dead cedar that we found at the bottom of one of the cliffs out on the islands in Fathom 5 National Marine Park. And this tree was over 1,500 years old when it died. And the actual center of the tree is actually right here, believe it or not. So what happened with this tree is uh, 
it started to it started to grow and then a bunch of the roots died and so there was only two roots root clusters that were still alive and then this one died but then one was still alive and it continued to grow for 1500 years with this one part of the root system still alive and we know from looking at the pattern of the tree rings in this tree that it was lying at the bottom of the cliff uh, since about 900 AD. So it was lying at the bottom of the cliff for 1100 years. So it actually started growing around 5, 600 BC and died around 900 AD. Their stunted appearance is a direct result of its geological environment. Limestone and dolomite is very, very resistant to erosion, but at the same time, the little cracks and uh, hollows that are in the, uh, in the rock allow water to go through them. Those cracks are the reason the trees grow here. We almost think about the cliffs as vertical swamps now, because there's actually a lot of water coming through the cliff faces. The water percolates down through the soil and through the rock, and then it, what it does is it emerges out of the cliff face. And so the, the trees get more than enough water uh, to, to survive, and at least the cedar trees. Most other trees can't do it, but the cedar trees can do it. Here in the national parks, at least they're protected. Outside of the parks on privately owned land, it's a different story. A lot of sections of the escarpment that are privately owned, there is nothing in place to protect these trees. And so there really wouldn't be anything in place that could prevent anyone from, from cutting one down, for example. It's a precarious balance for these relic cedar trees. Achieving balance for life under water is even more problematic. The same rocks that make up this area's stunning terrain are also a menace for mariners. The Wetmore is one of 27 protected shipwrecks in the waters of Fathom 5 National Marine Park. Like the Wetmore, most of the wrecks are 19th century ships. After so many accidents, three lighthouses went up and Georgian Bay was surveyed. And before the ships were protected, they were mostly considered fair game. In 1964, the Erie Treasure and Salvage Divers Limited uh, came to the Wetmore site to salvage the, the anchor chain and some other metal. And there's rumors that they were using explosives. And the community at the time were outraged by that and came out and essentially ran the company out of town. And that is one of the earliest examples of how committed the community is to uh, protecting uh, maritime heritage in this area. The rocky landscape that sunk many of these ships is also the main reason why the visibility is so great. There is no silt. We've always had good water clarity, but with the quagga and zebra mussels, it is getting uh, clearer. These invasive species cover the lake bottom like a bad shag carpet. They hitched a ride with the ballast water in large ships coming from Europe. Now, their population is exploding, threatening to destabilize the entire marine ecosystem forever. Each one of them filters a liter of water a day for phytoplankton, their food source. In the past, if we went back even 10, 15 years ago, I would characterize uh, Fathom 5 as uh, an open water uh, pelagic ecosystem where phytoplankton blooms in the springtime, zooplankton then catch up and feed on those populations, then small fish feed on the zooplankton or on the phytoplankton, and then big fish feed on the, the little fish. So a simple food web. 
the bigger fish in these waters were already in trouble from overfishing and previous invasions. Deep lake fish populations, like the Cisco's, had just started to recover. And now these shelled invaders are messing with their food source. So the fish are dealing with zebra mussels, which essentially is a junk food. It doesn't have the calories. It's, it's new to their diet. So I'm not sure what the outcome of this, of this uh, invasive species will be. The rock bed isn't helping either. Made of mostly magnesium and calcium carbonate, the invaders use the calcium in the rock to make their shells. Once the mussels die, the shells sit on the lake bottom. We still don't have a species, I think, that's going to effectively transfer all those that energy and nutrients from the lake bottom back into the water column. Ecologists are urgently studying the marine and coastal ecologies to try and get a handle on the situation. They look at water quality and plant distribution, but also at the fish populations that live in or visit these coastal areas. Already, they're seeing a change. of our nastiest invasive species. Gobies were also brought in by ballast water in ships coming from overseas. They eat mussels and other small fish, but the mussels at the lake bottom create a toxic stew. A neurotoxin bacterium grows in the mussels' feces. And the birds that eat the gobies are washing up on shore. If we could model and know exactly and we had the silver bullet to cure it all, we would, but we don't. There's a lot at stake. These parks are the largest remaining natural oasis in southern Ontario, but they're not without their challenges. Preserving life on this geological backbone is a constant struggle and requires a delicate balance. So a lot of people say, well, so what? You're a national park. You're a small bit of protected area in a sea of development. The battle's lost. What's the point? Why not spend that money uh, of parks towards something else? These are the people, I would say, who've never been to a national park. They've never experienced it for themselves, the beauty, the diversity, that connection to the natural environment. Breton Highlands National Park is the oldest national park in the Canadian Maritimes. The Cabot Trail winds through it, showing off the park's most striking assets. Though the park has a colorful history, not all of the memories are pleasant. In order to make this park, people lost their homes. With expropriation, it's, you know, it's not really up for negotiation. Now, the park is taking action to right the wrongs of the past. And they're ramping up their efforts to help Mother Nature in the fight against its prolific moose population, ravaging the park's already weakened forests. We're more to the point that we have to say, if we can do something, we should do something, because this is a significant national area.
the Cape Breton Highlands National Park, with its abundant wildlife and spectacular scenery, stretches out 950 square kilometers. It's a summer playground. It's actually warm enough here in the summer to, to swim in the ocean. Uh, a lot of people like to body surf or just uh, relax on the beach and, you know, they get mesmerized by the waves. Also in the summer, there's um, 25 hiking trails that you can take advantage of, as well as many interpretive activities throughout the park that we can offer every day. Located on the northern end of Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, the famous Cabot Trail lines the park on three sides. It's virtually impossible to travel here without seeing some kind of wildlife. Most of the time, animal crossings on the Cabot Trail are a great chance to see wildlife up close. But it can also be a hazard. Moose stand up to seven feet tall. They move quite often in darker hours, dusk and dawn, when the light isn't that good. And uh, they don't reflect a lot of light. So when motors come upon them, they may not see them and, uh, and collisions can occur. Making matters worse, the moose population here has exploded. Moose in the park exist at very high densities. Some places on the order of five, even 10 moose per square kilometers. Those are some of the highest densities ever recorded anywhere in the world. Now, their large numbers are decimating the forests that were already in trouble after the largest spruce budworm outbreak in the island's history. We really hit by kind of a perfect ecological storm of the budworm of the forest in a certain condition and then of moose afterwards. Coupled with that, the fact that um, moose don't have, um, outside of bear and coyote to a small extent, a large natural predator. Prior to the outbreak in the 1970s, these forests were mature, tall, and ripe for a spruce budworm infestation. The budworms eat leaves and killed these trees. That led to the moose infestation. And the way that happened was simply that um, light was allowed to penetrate as it normally does, and the species which grow up are uh, among the favorite food supply for moose and the moose just happened to be here in big numbers. And they were able to capitalize on this and then their numbers exploded almost in the same way that the budworm numbers exploded in, in the presence of such a great food supply of, uh, of fir trees. The difference being that the, uh, the, the moose really knocked down the forest and are preventing this, uh, this regeneration to occur. This area that we're standing in now really helps tell the story quite well. Behind us, we can see some of the standing live white birch, some of the carcasses, as we call them, the dead balsam fir, which would have died um, at the time of the outbreak. To top it off, grass is creeping in, stealing fertile land from the trees that would normally make up a boreal forest. The park is in full assessment mode as they try to figure out the best way to intervene. There are a number of radical measures the park could take, including introducing a natural predator or giving the moose birth control, among other things. But before they take such drastic measures, they also want to see how long it would take an area to recover if moose were kept out.
they built this 35 meter by 35 meter moose exclosure two years ago. Balsam fir, 30 centimeters. Just in two growing seasons, we've noticed a difference in the height of especially the preferred food species, the forage species for moose. Whereas outside here in the control plot, they seem to be pruned down pretty well every year. While park ecologists scramble to deal with the aftermath of the budworm and moose infestations, another threat looms underwater. Cape Breton Highlands National Park is located in prime whale watching territory. Around Cape Breton Highlands, the most common whale to see is the pilot whale. We get fin whales, uh, Atlantic white-sided dolphin. And there's been sightings from time to time of blue whales and humpbacks, which are usually that migrate through our waters. And the minke is fairly common to see as well. Whales might be the park's star marine attraction, but it's the smaller species living in land that play a critical role in the park's overall health. They're the connection between the forest, the barrens and wetlands to the ocean, and everything in our park that basically uh, goes to the coast and that we export to the ocean passes through aquatic waterways. Some of the waterways are in trouble the spiny cheek crayfish is taking over in Freshwater Lake near Inganish, one of the park's more popular lakes. So we noticed sometime between 2002, 2005 likely, uh, population was likely introduced into the lake. It could have been introduced by someone releasing an unwanted aquarium pet, or if someone was using crayfish as bait. Regardless, the crayfish's presence is threatening to throw a kink in the balance that's developed in this lake over thousands of years. With no sufficient natural predator here, that job is left to park staff. They trap and permanently remove the crayfish from the lake. We got quite a few on this one. A uh, couple of different size classes there, a couple of small ones, a couple of big ones, and he's just taking them and putting them in a bag so we can process them later. With the crayfish population exploding into the thousands, vulnerable species like the rare freshwater valve snail that the crayfish prey upon are disappearing fast. One crayfish can consume 100 snails a night. 6.55 total length, width 3.57, height 2.33, age, five. Muscles are also at risk. The older ones are slightly protected because their shells thicken as they age. But the juveniles are disappearing. If you have a population that basically is absent of its juvenile muscles as that sort of population goes through, you're eventually going to get to a point where you're going to have a population reduction overall or even a po uh, overall population extirpation from a lake, and, and that causes concern. And what we haven't directly attributed to the crayfish, it's, it's leading us in that direction. Outside of Cape Breton, Invading crayfish have been reported in all types of waterways, not just lakes.
Research and education are their main weapons as they try to prevent the crayfish from getting into the park's many rivers and streams. As well as keeping an eye out for crayfish, they also look for other impending hazards by monitoring water quality and the water's inhabitants, such as insects. Oh, awesome! Yeah. <laughs> Dragonfly larvae. Right there. Right there. These are the good guys. Insects in small streams act as an early warning system for stressors that could later affect native fish populations. <laughs> it's definitely good to have dragonflies around. And in these waterways, the Atlantic salmon population is already hovering dangerously close to the unsustainable mark. When you have a small population, they tend to be the ones that will face challenges, and you'll see population declines more rapidly than you will in some of the larger systems. So having an indication of how those small streams are changing over time, I think from the salmon's point of view, is, is relatively important. Adult Atlantic salmon only visit these waters to spawn. Switch on, so red up, thank you. We're live. The researchers use a method called electrofishing to assess their population. It temporarily stuns the fish and gives researchers enough time to study juveniles in the stream. Blasting anywhere between two and 400 volts into the river, the voltage amplifies through the water. Lift. Okay. Good. Two point two one. Fork length five point six. Toe length five point eight. We have a mixture of uh, brook trout, which is a typically good brook trout uh, habitat as well, along with uh, a few salmon. So uh, I wouldn't call the densities really high, but we sort of expected that from this location. It's a smaller river system, so it doesn't tend to have the high densities that we'd see in some, some of our, our park rivers. So. so far, the rivers and streams are safe from crayfish. People can still fish here, but these days, it's mostly catch and release. While the park is trying to maintain the area's cultural traditions, some things will never be the same again. Completed in 1932, the Cabot Trail is a feat of engineering. It hugs the roller coaster hills and travels up over the highlands and into the pristine forest. And so the visitor who is uh, traveling along the scenic route is able to experience uh, a diversity of landscapes that uh, the geology of Cape Breton offers. The park opened only a few years after they built the Cabot Trail. A third of it runs through the park connecting communities in the north from the eastern Inganish side to Shedekamp on the west side. It was one of the reasons why Cape Breton was chosen to become a national park, because it now was accessible to the world. Despite the world coming to Cape Breton, local traditions are still maintained and celebrated. The main cultural influences in the park are the Celtic, 
the Acadian French and the Mi'kmaq. And the Acadian is so alive and well, especially in the, on the shed camp side of the park. Acadians have been living in the Shedekamp area since 1785. The town is outside park limits, but one of the park's entrances is here. Tonight, there's a Scottish celebration called a milling frolic inside the visitor's center. Well, traditionally, the milling frolic was done by the men, and they would just uh, get in a circle and sing Gaelic songs as they worked, and the women would be cooking for them in the background, and they'd sing with them, and it was uh, a lovely family affair. <laughs> Not all the traditions and memories that are celebrated in the park are as lovely. Like many national parks across the country, to make way for this park, people were forced to sell their homes. At one time, this parkland outside of Shedekamp belonged to the Acadians until they were expropriated around 1935. Though the houses are no longer standing, some of the foundations still remain, which can be explored along Le Boutereau Trail. This here is a foundation which is typical of the 30 or so homes that used to be in this end of the park. Um, it belonged to, in this case, a family of Chesson. Houses here were fairly small even by 1930s standards, and the families were fairly large, sometimes 10 people or more living in the same house. Some people were happy to leave and move closer to town, and other people were not. Other people were quite content living here. On the other side of the park, it was mostly Irish Catholics who were forced to sell their homes. The expropriation was definitely not limited to the Shetty Camp area of the park. Although Shetty Camp got its fair share of it, but there's also an Inganish at the Highland Links Golf Course. People used to live there. You'll notice the church is on the golf course. Well, there was a community around that church at one time. This used to be all privately owned land. Stanley Thompson, the great Canadian designer, he was commissioned to put the golf course here, a nine hole golf course. And when he started the design, he got out so far and in his mind thought he ran out of land. So he decided we really should have 18 holes. And so the park expropriated a little bit more land and took the course up the valley and then back into the clubhouse. Year after year, this course is consistently rated as one of the top golf courses in the country. Our employees, if you count up the number of service years that are here, it, it would be incredible. I mean, when fa people are joining the park when they're 20 years old and they're still employed here when they're 60, and you know, it's it's. I th I think we've we've more than paid our dues. But long before any Europeans lived here. Going back 4,000 years, these lands were once the traditional hunting and fishing grounds for the nomadic Native American Mi'kmaq tribe. Today, they don't live in the park, but they do see themselves as stewards of the land, so they already work closely with the park on ecological issues. There is a lot of the uh, Celtic culture and the Acadian culture celebrated here. There should be more of the Mi'kmaq culture celebrated here. Maybe more interpreters, maybe have elders come into a visitor center or certain areas and 
do uh, display how they do their craft work or storytelling. Parks Canada will be putting up interpretive panels depicting the Mi'kmaq history. And though Cape Breton Highlands is the oldest national park in the Maritimes, in many ways it's still evolving. The moose population needs to stabilize. The vegetation needs to recover. The waterways need to be protected. And the park is reaching out. One of the teachings uh, from our elders is that a spruce tree doesn't care if a birch tree is beside it or a willow or a pine. They, they coexist. And they hold the earth together because underneath the uh, floor, the trees are holding hands. They're holding hands. And our elders say humans should do the same thing. <laughs> 